going to share a testimony. <clears throat> Maybe. <laughs> oh. Okay, Jim. Thanks, Jamie. So, so like I said, I'm just up here this morning to share a testimony. <clears throat> Um, for the past four weeks, the enemy has tried to lie to my flesh about my good health. And so when I was praying to God about, about it all, he would always tell me, you are healed. Stand in your healing. You are healed. So I knew that all these emotions that I were, that I was going through up and down, I was, um, in a state where I was asking God why at a point, um, because it was something that God told me he healed me of a long time ago. Down on my face, crying, you know how we all can get there. Um, but every time, like I said, he would tell me I'm healed. You are healed. Rise. Walk in your healing. So I knew at that moment, obviously, that the enemy was trying to bring deception. So I just decided to look that word up for my own. And here's the word, the literal meaning of deception. It says, the act of causing someone to accept as true or valid what is false or invalid. Yeah. So as I've been praying <clears throat> in God's word, I heard this in my spirit. And it's Ephesians 4.28. And 4.28 says, let him that stole steal no more. So what I believe the Spirit is trying to get us to understand is that the enemy should not be stealing from us right. in our health, in our finances, yes. in our relationships. Yes. He should not be stealing from us. The, yes. He's trying to deceive us to believe things that are false or invalid. Right. We need to stand in God's promises and make that devil tuck his tail and run. <clears throat> so last Sunday I was feeling pretty down in my flesh and... Tammy came, I don't know if anybody else noticed this, but Tammy came off the stage and she said just a few words to me. She said, God wanted me to tell you that the devil is a liar. Yes. And then in that moment, tongues came out of her and I literally felt the healing of God come over my body. So since last Sunday, I have taken a stand. Stand. I'm telling this devil that he can no longer steal from me. He can no longer steal from my family. And he can no longer use his deceiving lies to trick me into believing something other than the word of God. God also revealed to me that a lie cannot stay in my midst. He said, because God, I am in your midst. He and a lie can't mix, so where God is, there is no lie that can stand, right. and it has to bow and go. Yeah, right. So from that moment that Tammy spoke those words to me, through this week, God has empowered even my flesh to take that stand in him. And I'm also up here to encourage anybody, if you do hear from God through the service, to step out and see Say whatever he has on your mind because you don't know what can happen in that moment. He, he literally has encouraged me to know that he does hear my cry. Even yes. when I'm down in the valley, he hears my cry. Yes. And he'll get that word to you if, if we're in need of it. So I just I was hoping Tammy would be here this morning. I just wanted to thank her for being obedient and stepping out and doing that because we all need encouragement. God also wanted me to say, we all need to be gathered together. We need to edify each other through this time. Because these times, even though we are victorious in these times, they're dark. And the enemy is going to try to deceive. He's going to try to bring doubt into your heart. And he can't. If we don't let him steal, he can't do that to us. So that was the encouraging word that I wanted to share today, plus my testimony. So we just got to keep focused on him, keep our eyes to the one that has done all things for us. Yes. So anyway. So 
so with that, if anybody else has a good testimony, yeah. Well, as Spurcher came to me, he said, you know, about stealing, come to steal. Yeah. Well, that's what God's word says. A thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give life and life yeah. more abundantly. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And that's the end part. Yeah. 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 So that, you know, supersedes that yes. part. Yes, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Really Such. powerful. Yep. You can walk for a long time and have in your body. God says you're healed. Yeah. I don't see it. Yep. I don't see it. But you're doing the right thing. Yes. Believe it. You're still functioning. Yeah. You're still moving. You're still going. I've yep. seen so many times, you know, <clears throat> you get this hurts, that hurts, and you want, and of course the enemy immediately, well, something really terrible. Yeah. This is not just the yep. ordinary.
touchdowns too because he's the father of liars. Yeah. Everything he says is a lie. Yes. A lie all the time. You can be pretty good at it. Yep. And that's what he's done over the years. He has perfected the art of being a deceiver and being a liar. Mm -hmm. And because we want to believe what our body's telling us, yeah. we end up believing what the devil's telling us. And that, that is contradiction honestly, it is. Yep. to what God says. Right. So it happened in the garden. Adam and Eve believed a twisted story mm -hmm. of their reality. Right. And it, and it come to pass. What yeah. God had said was still the truth, but they bought into the, the enemy's deception. Right. They lost their destiny. They, yeah. they missed out on what God had perfected before. Now, they still, it was still accomplished, but not in the way God wanted it to be. Right. Right. Amen. Yes, amen. Yes, Lord. Some people have been told, you know, in sending in some keys or letters to kind of set them. Mm -hmm. And this was happening when she was a teenager. Well, there's two facets to the situation. She could have either outgrown it or it was misdiagnosed way back then. And the only thing that would attack this, uh, this organism is, is the, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this medication. Which by clindamycin and all this other stuff, and it's part of something that was saying this thing was going rampant. <laughs> anyway, um, two things was happening also in that. Now that the, she knows she's not allergic to penicillin, they're hammering her with it, and it's got the organism in there too. Maybe it's, it's <coughs> either healing it or not. <coughs> the second thing the Lord was telling me at that time, He says, How many people have been told something wrong in their life when they were young? And they believed it for so many yeah. years. So many years. The Lord said, this is a new day. Yes. This is the day of new beginnings. My mercy is new every morning. Mm -hmm. Take those lies that you've consumed for all these years. Right. And let them go this morning. Yes. Let them go. Yes. And so. Thank you. Yes. Amen. Just said you'd come home. And, yep. And uh, this is over. <coughs> Amen. So Amen. Amen. Amen.
Yes, he not did. One Glory. Time has he broken his word. Right. Ever. Right. That's what we Amen. feed ourselves. Yep. Feed ourselves with that. Yes. I told yeah. Gabby last night, if God, <coughs> she's her first year of college and this is wrong and that, everything. I said, Gabby, remember this. If God before us. Yes. Mm-hmm. You've got to, like Tony said, you've got to believe it. It's yes. It's, why do we believe that and not this? Right. Because we have spiritually discerned yep. something in us says, this is this the truth. God. Yeah. Right. I've sought God to yes. not lead me to the truth. Yes. Amen. And he will. I said, mm-hmm. if God be for you, sweetheart, yep. nobody can be for right. you. Right. Amen. It may look like it, and they may have a little victory here or there, but the war is on. Yes. Right. The victory is on. Yes. yes. Amen. Oh, yes. Yes. Jesus' 
is your Lord and Savior, mm -hmm. Jim, you know? And she said, yeah. I said, well, is there anything that I can pray specifically, you know, uh, that we can pray about, your children, your family, or anything? So I had the opportunity to share with her a little bit, you know, the love of Jesus. And mm -hmm. uh, another lady um, all crippled up started talking to her, and she was supposed to have had surgery two years ago on her hand, but she's too tiny, too fragile. So they won't do it. I said, well, well, let's pray that the Lord puts some weight on your bones. You yeah. So yeah. I said, we're going to pray that the Lord heals this hand that you don't have to have surgery. But in the meantime, if you right. want to gain some weight. So, I mean, just doors opened up. They asked me yeah. if I'd come out there and volunteer. They're like, will you just come out? And please just come out, and you know, when you're back on your feet. And then they says, you know, furthermore, can we use your cleaning service? Would you like to grow your cleaning service? Because we have people that go home. And yeah. uh, then they need a housekeeper. And everything we can tell you would just like be a perfect person for most of our people here yeah. and, uh, yeah. so I don't know I still don't know where yeah. it's going I don't yeah. know if I'm going to micromanage I don't know <laughs> what's going to happen or where it's going but you know I'm just open to whatever the Lord That's wants right. and right. and uh, I've listened to so many healing CDs oh my goodness my mind has just been listening to uh, the healing <coughs> healing uh, from Bethel Church in Redding California healing school I mean, I'm just ready to go lay hands on everybody and say, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's how easy it is. Yeah, when you start seeing this stuff, I know. And you're just like, wow. <laughs> I mean, it's not hard. We just make it so hard. Yes, I mean, we I do. I hours of just saturating right. all this stuff. And it's like, why am I in this house? I need to be out on the streets laying hands on people. Yeah, that's the truth. Amen. You know? But yeah. I just thank the Lord that really yes. sincerely, I, even in the hospital, I, they, they was giving me 10 milligrams of oxycodone every four hours. And so I was sleepy and never awake, I don't think. And uh, I said, you know what, you got to cut this down. I can't function. I'm just, so I cut it down to like every uh, six hours or every eight hours. And I said, give me five. That's all I want. And I haven't mm -hmm. had things done in two weeks. So thank the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Yeah. Suzanne. Yes. He only restores. Yes. He only reconciles. That's what yes, God Lord. Lord. Yes. yes. The enemy is trying to say, no, look at my work. Look right. at my work. Look at my work. Right. And his work is a lie. Yes. His work is a lie. It is.
Yes. And that oil lasts. Yes. That water dries up when the sun comes out, but that oil lasts. True. And so it just it's and so sometimes when I'm praying and I'm thinking about the river, it's just the oil. It's Amen. the oil of Gilead. It's the balm of Gilead. It's the oil of Gilead. It's so much more yes. than just a river. Right. It's life. Yes. And that it life is. is a spark of fire. Yes, Lord. Uh, Amen. Anybody else? Let's stand. Go to the Lord in prayer. Just like Mike said, let's just lay down the lie that the enemy's trying to deceive you with and just trust God for his goodness. So, Lord, we just come to you right now, God, in the name of Jesus, believing in your truth and in your word, Lord. We know that the devil is a deceiver, God. That's all he can do. That's all he can use against our flesh, Lord. But we know that you are God, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, God. What you said is truth, God. We stand on that truth, God. We gird ourselves in your word because we know, God, that the devil is a liar. He is under our feet, Lord. He is under our feet. You have raised up an army, God. This is your army, Lord. We will go out, God, and we will attack his lies, Lord, because he cannot stand in our midst because you are in our midst. Thank you, God, for healing our bodies, our minds. Thank you, God, for prospering everything we touch. Thank you, God, for healing us, Lord, physically and emotionally, Lord. You have healed us. We just have to step into that reality, God, to know you are for us and not against us, God. Every time the enemy comes with a lie, Lord, we replace it with your word. We do have the faith in us, Lord, because you are in us. And it is good. It is good all the time, God. We love you, Lord, and thank you for the testimonies that have been shared, God, because it encourages us to go forward. Because we know we are victorious, Lord. We are victorious this day, Lord. You are a now God. And now, God, what happened yesterday is gone. We focus right now in your truth and in your love. We love you, Lord. We praise you. I thank you for your people, God. You have called us to this church. You have called us all together in your midst. Because you do have promises for us, Lord. And we will stand on that truth, God. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. And thank you, Jesus. In your mighty name we pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jordan, you're up. Okay. If you have got a cell phone, if you can turn it on silent or completely off. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and now let's speak the word because we know the word is truth and where we send it, it can can't return void. So Lord, will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Every disease 
If you'd like to pray over the offering. Heavenly Father, we're yes, so thankful to be here today, Lord. We're just so thankful to have others and sisters that we can share the battle stories with. Yes, Lord. We need to encourage one another. Yes, and God. We thank you that there is love and peace and understanding among your people. We are sorry that at times we fail ourselves more than you. Jesus, forgive us. You are we see us as pure and holy. Yes, yes. Sometimes we don't see ourselves that way, but Father, Jesus, help us to we are. grasp yeah. that image and yes. understand. We thank you for hiding us in the world. Yes. We don't know exactly what's going to happen because neither does the devil. Right. He doesn't know. Right. He, if he'd have known who you were right. and really known who you were, you wouldn't have been able to go to Calvary. Jesus. But Lord. thank God he was in the dark and he's in the dark about each and every yes. one of us. Yes. So we thank you, Lord. Yes. yes. You bless this offering. Uh -huh. Encourage us. Yes, Lord. Help us to encourage one another. <clears throat> yes. For we ask it all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And one more thing that I've been hearing since we've been praying is God doesn't do things halfway. He does it completely for you. So anyway, let's just worship him.
the Lord will work through anyone in this room. So we keep waiting for someone to listen. Say, we'll pray for that person. I don't care if you're young, little, or you're old. If you have a, if you have a problem, the Lord is calling and speaking to you right now for those greatest troubles. Don't worry. Now is the time. Someone is waiting for you.
God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Sing that song, Show Me Your Face, Lord. I just invite you to turn and look at the person next to you. You want to see the face of God? It's right here. Praise the Lord. Show me your face, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. God bless all of you. Appreciate your testimonies, prayer requests. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for praying for one another. Thank you for showing us the face of God this morning already. Praise God. Amen. God bless all of you. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Jody, for opening and sharing your testimony. It was a blessing. Got everything going off to the right way. And uh, thank you, Sheila, for showing up and making all of our day as well. Praise the Lord. Great to see you back. Much sooner than most expected, but thank, not the Lord. Amen. So great to have you back with us again. Praise the Lord. We're expecting to see Cindy in the same way. Amen. In Jesus' name. So. Again, God bless all of you. The Sunday school classes, they can be dismissed to go downstairs. So he, he went up front, and they're like, okay, we won't touch you. Well, unbeknownst to this little boy, <laughs> uh, he comes up, and the fire of God's in him, and he touches this big old guy, and he falls down, and he's, and he's delivered. I mean, he's just totally, and he's like, who touched me? Just really mad, and really angry. Like, it's like, we didn't touch you. We didn't touch you. That little 10-year-old touched you. <laughs> Praise God. And that little guy couldn't be mad anymore. It's like, hey, you know. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Dan, speaking of young people, thank you, Joden, for taking care of the overhead. Did a great job. Praise the Lord. Yeah, she deserves a hand. Praise God. Did a good job. Good job, Joden. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, you know, uh, we were talking about the Lord manifesting himself, showing himself, revealing himself, and how the devil lies and God's trying to get the truth to us. And that's really what I want to talk to you about this morning. It's very simple, but sometimes I've found that some of the simplest messages speak more to me than uh, the ones you try to get real deep on and just confuse everybody, praise the Lord. But I want to talk to you about salvation. I want to talk to you about real salvation. I want, I'm not just talking about the... Uh, the, the typical way that we think of being born again, which is absolutely good, and, and, and obviously we all need to be born again to be saved and, and uh, to be one with Christ. But it goes much further than that, and I think we have, we've been amiss when it comes to really talking about what happens to us when we get saved. Yeah. I mean, it's been more about, you know, well, I'm not going to hell now, so that's a good thing, and, which it is a good thing, but that really isn't what it's about. That's almost a, you know, a, a perk that comes with salvation. It's not the whole point of salvation. Otherwise, God would immediately take us the moment we got born again and we'd be through all this mess. But there's a reason for us being here. It's the same reason that Jesus came in the first place, and that is to bear image of God, to reveal God. And we see ourselves, because of the enemy and all the things that we've already talked about, how the devil lies to us, we see ourselves so, so less than what we really are. And we, I think sometimes we've been afraid uh, to really speak out boldly who and what we are in Christ for fear that it would sound like blasphemy. Well, it sounded like blasphemy when Jesus did it, and he was just simply the firstborn of many brethren. I think it's time that we began to really boldly declare who we are so that we can accomplish what God has left us here and put us here for in the first place. So that's what I really want to talk to you about. So there's going to be a lot of familiar scriptures, but I want to just go a little bit under the skin maybe and, and kind of really flesh out 
what God is saying to us in a lot of these uh, situations and kind of bring it into a, uh, an understandable uh, framework. Because we are more than conquerors. Yes. We are the offspring of God. We are kings and priests. We are all things to all people as we walk in Christ, as we recognize and understand our identity. That's how we lay hands on the sick and they get recovered. They don't, they don't, nobody gets recovered when Nathan prays for them. Hey, that's just a fact. And he won't get, they won't get delivered, you know, when you pray for them. But when you pray in Christ, when you pray in your real identity, not your flesh, not your humanity, but that humanity that is joined with Christ, then you function just like Jesus. That's our, that's our inheritance. That's our heritage, amen, in Christ. And so until we see ourselves, see the devil, he spends his whole career and our lifetimes trying to convince us that we're just flesh and blood that may be a little bit better than some other flesh and blood. No, we are flesh and blood joined to God, one with God, just exactly like Jesus was. That's why we had to be born from above. You can go through all the histrionics of that and the, and the, you know, the metaphysical or the physical and how does the sperm you know, from God get to that. Look, just forget all that. This is how it happens. God breathes life into somebody and they become a living soul. We were all dead Amen. In our trespasses and sins. God breathed the Ruach or the, the life of God into us and we become living beings. We become God-like. Yes. And anybody tell you, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute, back up now. Listen, you read the Bible. Jesus said himself. You know, you, you read the scriptures and they, they, they declare that you are gods. So why are you complaining when I come and tell you that I'm the son of God? That I am God in the flesh. Praise the Lord. So if I make you nervous this morning, just get over it. Pass, you know, just put your own spin on it and make it sound good and comfortable for you. But I'm just going to say it the way I see it. Praise God. Yes. And I'll leave it up to God to work all that out. Thank God for grace. Praise the Lord. So I want to begin with Genesis chapter 1, and I want to read verses 26 and 27. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Praise the Lord. Now, uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Yeah. All right. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Colossians 2, 8 through 10. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. That's probably one of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible. Now I know, you know, we can change that from day to day based on where we're at and what we're dealing with, but to me, that is sending a powerful signal, a powerful message from God to each one of us. Praise the Lord. Out of everything that God made, Adam was specifically created to image the infinite life of God. That's what separated Adam from the rest of creation. It wasn't his ability to be self-aware. It wasn't all the things that we think about. Well, oh, he's not an animal. He's the... No, it was the life of God that made him different than everybody else. The breath that God breathed into him was God life. It was God's spirit. It made him different. It made him like God. It made him a spirit being connected to God. Amen? So not only was Adam designed to be an image bearer of God, Adam was created as an embodied agent. Okay? He wasn't just, he wasn't just a, an image bearer, but he was 
a body for God. God is invisible. God walked in the garden. Don't fool yourself into thinking he had feet and legs. He didn't. He was just in the garden. If God was walking in the garden, it was because he was in Adam. Praise the Lord. So he was an embodied agent, uniquely designed to be filled with, and not just to be filled with, but participate in the Godhead. Yeah, that's, you know, I'm saying, we are more than what we think we are. Yes. Now we're talking about Adam. Yes. Now God gives Adam a body through the declaration of his word so that Adam could share in a finite way the life of God, which is exactly what Jesus did. He was God in the flesh, but he lived finitely while he was here. He, he lived like a human. But he wasn't a human. He was God, and yet he was a human. Right. You are just like that. Adam's the prototype. Jesus is the, is the perfection of that. And we are the offspring of him. That's why God has him name the animals. Why? Because it's with words that God speaks things into existence. The animals were there, but they were... They were nothing. They were just, they had no, no value, no purpose, no, no function until they were named. Until, you know, understand the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, names mean something. Yeah. Names are given to define a person, to define their life, to, to, to tell, them, tell people, as soon as you hear that name, you know who that is. Jacob, the deceiver. Israel, prince with God. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Abraham, father of many nations. They, the names had a value, not, not like what we give names today is just to identify somebody in a crowd, but names spoke to their existence, to their purpose, to their reality. Right. So Adam spoke the names of the animals, and they became that thing. They became whatever that name right. was. God gave him that kind of authority. He's sharing his infinite with the finite. He's letting him speak God words into the earth. And what he spoke became reality. Yes. Now, if that weren't true, the whole mess wouldn't have happened. He had power. He had authority. Man had abilities and powers and authorities in this earth. Amen. He wasn't just some vagabond, some, you know, uh, homeless guy wandering through the woods right. with a lot of fruit to eat. He was God in the flesh. Yes. He was a man filled with God. And when God tells us the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily, we are complete in him. Yes. We are part of the Godhead. Yes. You can talk about the Trinity, you can talk about oneness, you can call it whatever you want to call it, but we are in Christ. We are, therefore, we have to be part of the Godhead. We have to be in the Godhead. Right. I'm talking about authority, yes. church. I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from God as if I could. I'm, I'm trying to add to us. I'm trying to tell you what God says we are, what God died to give us so that we could participate in the infinity of God, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, eternal of God, which is just another way of saying the life of God. So back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. A lot of times we read that, and of course we know we can kind of spiritualize it, but the truth is normally when we read something like that, we think of it as somebody giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, and, you know, they blew, and now we're breathing. Now we've got air in our lungs. That's not what happened. That word breath is ruach, and it actually is Hebrew for breath, but it's Hebrew for spirit. They are the same word. They're the, they had the same meaning, in other words. So God breathed the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is life. Yes. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no life. Right. So he breathed the Holy Spirit into Adam. Now, it's God's nature to not give anything less than the fullness of himself. So when you, when you need healing, what are you, what are you getting? Are you getting healing? No, you're getting God. You're getting the fullness of God when it comes to that reality. He never gives sparingly. He always gives the fullness. In fact, look at John chapter 1 and verse 16. 
You didn't get a little Holy Ghost. You know what I mean? You didn't get a little saved. You got the fullness of God. You got all of God when God gave you yes. salvation, when yes. His grace gave salvation. Of His fullness, of His fullness, that's not a hard word. Of His fullness have all we received and grace for grace. We're not, we didn't get some. We got the fullness. You say, well, God's ever, how can you have that? How, how can you have the fullness? I, I don't know how, I just know we did. Because it's a spirit. It's not how big we are, how much we can hold. We, we have the fullness. If Jesus was a man and, and lived in the time that he lived, he was probably 5'6", five, 5'5", five, five, some were maybe shorter yet than that. Not, not a huge mammoth of a guy. He was an average sized guy in his time because it says, you know, he didn't stand out in the crowd. It wasn't like he, you know, you would see him immediately and say, oh, there's something special about that guy. And yet the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. And we are complete in him. Praise God. So, you know, let me just say this. Don was talking about him and Jane's, the longevity of their marriage and how every marriage, you know, we know. Thank God the other person, or hopefully that other person is going to be up when you're down because otherwise it can really get funky in a hurry, you know. But God, how I many know God's not male or female? He has no gender. God's just God. So, well, Adam was not complete because of that. Why? Why was he not complete? Because he wasn't like God. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't yet the image of God because he had gender. Right? He had a male-specific body. And so God takes the rib from ish, is the Hebrew word for man, and he takes that Ish, and he made it into Isha, which is female or woman. Why? Because he wanted him to be in his image. So after personally fashioning the woman, God presents man and woman to one another as the completion of themselves. So we can get off into all the homosexual stuff and everything else, but I'm telling you, there's a reason for it's man and woman. Because we are incomplete. We're not God-like without that balance. I mean, I learned a long time ago, women are different than guys in a lot of ways. Not just physically, but in so many other ways. I mean, it's hard to have a conversation sometimes with a woman, if you don't know them. Because yeah. you're thinking, why, why, why would they even think something? Why would they even say something like that? Because they're not you, stupid. They're, they, they don't think like you. Yeah. They think differently. Yeah. And thank God they do. Yeah. So God united the Ish and the Isha together as one. Genesis chapter 2, 24 and 25. Now, we always talk about this at a wedding, but I'm, say, I'm telling you, it's, there's more to this than just a wedding service. <laughs> Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's how God sees it. Now, we could say, well, you know, that's because of intercourse. It's because of a lot of it. No, it's because when God puts you together with this woman, he sees you as a complete one, a, a, a unified reality. Praise the Lord. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and they weren't ashamed. Why? Why? Are you ashamed when you see yourself naked, as long as there's nobody else around to see you? Well, it's just you, right? They weren't ashamed because it was just them were one. That was the prototype for the rest of humanity. Now, it could be a metaphor, but I think it's a, it's a reality as well. Because God looked on all that word had spoke into existence. 
including man or Adam and Eve. Human. Complete. And he declared it to be very good. And it was for a while. But look at Mark 10 and verse 18. Now, Scripture doesn't contradict itself, so I'm going to... Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, and that's God. Jesus wasn't saying he wasn't God, and he wasn't saying he wasn't good. He was just asking the guy, because I talked about this Wednesday night, the guy thought he was good. In other words, he, he, he's saying, I keep all the commandments, and in fact, by saying that he keeps all the commandments, he broke the first commandment. He was declaring himself to be good without God. Amen? He has another God before him. Yeah. He, he was committing idolatry. It was personal idolatry. But Jesus said, there's only one thing that's good, mm -hmm. and that's God. God sees this completion, <coughs> Adam and Eve, and he said, it's good. It's God. Mm -hmm. It's a God thing. Yeah. They are a God thing. Yes. Amen. So the serpent enters. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Jody, to your testimony this morning and to all the things that were said. This is what the devil does. He, he offers an alternate reality which isn't reality at all, it's a lie. And so that's what he did. He's the serpent, the devil, and Satan. So look at Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 13 through 17. Now this is not, you know, when I say this, uh, Ezekiel 28, 13 through 17. When I say this, it isn't so that we go around saying, oh, I'm God. I mean, you know, I'm good. I'm like God. In fact, I am part of God. It isn't that because Jesus was God in the flesh. He is God in the flesh. He is God and he is like us or we are like him once we're born again. But here's what the scripture says. The scripture says, though he was God, he didn't commit robbery to be equal with God, and yet he humbled himself. Yes. He lived as a human, yes. operating by God's power, by the, right. by the authority of God's life that was in him. Yes. So this isn't about us being able to go around and say, oh, you see, because I'm really special because I'm part of the Godhead, or I'm in the Godhead, and I'm complete, and you're not. That's not the point. We humble ourselves. We live in a human world, but we operate in the power of God. So he said, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. This is the devil. So the, the, devil, the devil was there. The devil was in the garden with Adam and Eve. This wasn't like the first time Adam and Eve ever saw the devil. He was there. He was part of creation. He was in the garden. God put him there. I don't have all the you know, understanding of his purposes and so on and so forth, but the scripture says angelic beings are there to serve us or to be, you know, to minister to us. Right. So he had a function, but it was not to rule over Adam and Eve. He was there to, 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 to do as they, as they commanded. And they knew him. They saw him. It wasn't like he just popped up one day and they go, oh, my God, a snake. No, it was the serpent. That's why they listened. They, they apparently had communication with him before. So he, that has been in the Garden of Eden or in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the uh, carbuncle, and the gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was uh, created till iniquity was found in thee. 
By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. So that's Satan. He'd, seen, he'd been seen before. He had been in the garden. He was in the garden as part of creation. He had been in heaven. But when God created the earth, Satan was put there in the garden. He was part of creation. And so Adam and Eve had authority over him as God's embodied agents. Satan is filled with indignation. You, you saw God's own description of him. He's jealous. He's furious. He's indignant. Amen? He is, he, he's almost like he's insane with jealousy and pride. And so he approaches Adam and Eve, these people who are now God. And he can't ever be anything but an angel that God created. And so he's freaking out, and he comes to Adam and Eve, and his intent is a coup d'etat. He wasn't coming just to try to trick them into being stupid or do something ignorant. He was trying to get authority. He was trying to do what he could not do any other way. He was unable to. And having failed at, at uh, overthrowing God's rule and, and authority, he attempts to usurp it by convincing Adam and Eve to enter into an agreement with him instead of God. In other words, to commit spiritual adultery. See, Adam and Eve were the bride of God. We see them as two separate people, but God saw them as one complete. They were his bride. It, it nothing changed because Jesus comes along and we become the bride of Christ. All through the scripture, God's, God shows himself to be the husband. And his covenant people are his bride. So he gets them to commit spiritual adultery. They're making Satan husband, God of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's actually the tree of death, because they die as a result of eating it. There was a tree of life in that garden. So by eating the forbidden fruit, and accepting Satan's explanation of the world over God's explanation, God said it's good. It's all good. You're good. The knowledge of good and evil changed that. It's not all good anymore. Now there's good and evil. Now there's something other than what God declared in the earth. And it could only happen if something in the Godhead participated in that usurping or, or rebellion. Satan knew it. So he manipulates, he deceives, and Adam and Eve switch their allegiance from God to Satan. They divorce God, they left God, commit adultery with Satan in, in that spiritual sense, and they make a covenant with, with Satan. You know, every, every covenant had a covenant meal. The eating of that forbidden fruit was a covenant meal as far as the Satan and Adam and Eve were concerned. They just broke covenant with God. That's why blood had to be shed. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? And so if you think of a woman having childbirth, I don't know how it happened before this. Of course, there weren't any children born yet, but God had a plan for them to be born, and I don't think there would have been a lot of bloodshed. 
but we know that there is. So here they have done what? They've divorced themselves from light himself. God didn't have to kill him. They committed suicide. They divorced themselves from life. The Ruach, the, the, the life of God, the spirit of God that was given to them, they divorced themselves from it. God didn't have to do anything other than just stand there and watch it happen. Adam and Eve died. They didn't just drop over dead, so what, what happened? Although physical death, you know, would eventually come and take Adam and Eve and they'd go back to dust from whence they came, reversing the created order that God had. The immediate death was spiritual death. Separation from God. Divorced from God. Dead. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Reconcil reconciliation, put back in the original yes. condition where you were before yes. you were dead. Yes. When Adam and Eve died spiritually, they breathed out the spirit that united them to the Father. Adam and Eve also experienced disunion to one another. We won't go there for the sake of time, but Genesis 3.12 and 13 talks about First thing happens, Eve turns on Adam, and Adam turns on Eve. Yeah. They were one before that. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, he did it. She told me to do it. Yeah. That woman you gave me. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, they're not one anymore. They're two distinct individuals that are fussing and fighting with each other. Yeah. Why? Because they don't have God life anymore. Yeah. They're dead to their union, to their reality, yeah. to their completeness. And, and if, you read, if you look at the scriptures, subsequently God even addresses them as individuals, whereas before they were a unified whole. They were a one. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, there are two distinct individuals. Dead to God. Genesis 3, verses 16 through 19. Of course, this is where God pronounces what he's going to do and how he's going to do it and to restore this original reality. And the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. That, he wasn't ever to be ruling over her. They were one. How can you rule over yourself? Right. This, is a, this is a result of the fall. So husband, and he shall rule over thee. And to Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth, and thou, and, and thou shalt eat the herb, uh, the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return. So the creation is flipped. And if you look at the scriptures from Genesis 3 all the way through Malachi, you have a history of disunion, discord, yeah. death. Yeah. It's the theme for all of humanity. Yeah. Everybody, I don't care what planet, I mean, what, what country, what, what nationality, it's this, that way for everybody. So all through the Old Testament, God refers to himself as a husband. And the covenant people are his wife or his bride. Humans divorce themselves from God, and yet God remains faithful. That's the whole book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 2, verses 16 through 20, just as a little marker here. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishai. Remember Ish and Isha? Now we got Ishai. Not, you'll call me complete. 
and shall call me no more Baali. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of their mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. Now, what do we do when we get married? We take the wife takes the husband's name, right? Yeah. Their husband was Balaam, was satanic, was demonic. He said, that name's not going to be there anymore. You're going to take my name. Okay? And so, and that day I'll make a covenant with them, and the beasts of the field, with the fowls of the heaven, with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely, which is going to take us all the way back to the Genesis. And it was all good, right? There weren't animals devouring each other and other and humans and so on and so forth. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I'm saying this is more than going to heaven, church. It's so much more. We have so much more than we, the devil has convinced us that we're just this stepchild, this kind of, you know, jerky kid that, you know, God puts up with. No, we are part of the Godhead. God sees us as part of him. If a husband and a wife become one flesh, that's what God is saying, I'm doing for you. We're not going to be God and you. It's going to be one. It's going to be complete. I'm going to have the completeness that I declared and tried to show you in Adam and Eve. Yes. Praise God. Now, Adam and Eve ate fruit of destruction. And, and, and the result was separation and death. So look at, the t look at the language that God uses. He's trying to, I mean, he couldn't make it more clear. They ate of the tree, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. It killed them. It, it separated them from God. It divorced them from God. They became individuals with, with their own agendas and battles and wars and, and all the rest of the junk that goes with it. But look at Luke chapter 1, verse 42. And God ruachs to this little Hebrew gal. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. The fruit of thy womb. All right, John chapter 6, verse 53 and 54. Now, after all these years, we see the tree of life. It's all been about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But now all of a sudden, the tree of life shows up. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He's saying he is the fruit of Mary's womb, the breath of God. And he said, you're going to have to eat this fruit to get back to the garden, to get back into covenant relationship, back into the marriage with God, to where we are one with God again. Praise the Lord. Instead of us just, you know, the incarnation of God in flesh is the opposite of safe. Yeah. It's daring. It's bold. It's in your face. It stretches our understanding, not just of nature of God, but it stretches the imagination of the nature of God and the capacity of humanity. Because we know we'll never figure out all of God. But this is more than just making God different than what we thought. But it stretches what humanity can be. Yes. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 17.
For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. This is everybody from Adam. Because they had a fear of death. We're not, I'm, it's not just physical death. He's talking about, he's talking about this fear of, of, of incompleteness, of never being one with God, never being completely who we were created to be. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Praise the Lord. So instead of us just having a close relationship with Jesus or somehow appearing to be one with him, incarnation proves humanity is capable of being united or made one with the divine. I don't know about anybody else, but I got goosebumps on goosebumps now. I know we all hear this stuff, but how often, how, how, have we ever really embraced it? Have we ever really believed the depth of this thing and the power of this thing and what this reality is and what God died to give us? Yes. Praise God. And that divinity is capable of being and willing to be united to humanity. Yes. The God of creation, the God that is eternal, that ever was and ever will be. He chose, not only is he able, but wanted to be one with humanity. He died for this. And we think it's about going to heaven? God created us with a capacity to live in him. Christ. The incarnation proves it. If that weren't so, then Jesus Christ, God and man, could not be one person. Because the difference between creator and creature would be so great that the incarnation would be impossible. But not only is union with Christ possible, Church, it's necessary for salvation. You can't be saved unless this is true. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm looking at you all together different. Paul said, I see Christ and him crucified. That's all I can see. I see God in men. I see you. I see God. I see a complete person, what they were created to be in the first place, what this, why this world is so screwed up, because it's incomplete, because it's looking for everything, but it'll never find it. We can give it any name we want to give it, it's hatred, it's bitterness, it's bias, it's prejudice, it's, it's, just, it's greed, it's what, no, it's not being who we were created to be, it's not being complete in God. That's why Paul uses the phrase in Christ 164 times to describe the actual place where salvation, justification, and eternal life exists. Eternal life is not something God produces, but somebody God offers himself. Colossians 1 verse 15. I mean, see, Jesus, we were said, you know, he, he only said what he heard his father say, he only did what he saw his father do. Why? Because, see, he understood this. He had revelation that God's trying to give to us. That's why he did what he did. Because he didn't do it by the power of God. He did it by his union with God. He did it by his oneness with God. Which is why the devil is all about trying to keep us separate from God. Trying to make it about us. Anything but our, our true identity of being one in God. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. 
talking about Jesus, the image of the invisible God, first one to come along since Adam. Firstborn of every creature. That's not talking about every animal. He's talking about of every human, of every created being. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits that we have to eat of, right? Get back to the tree of life. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So, Christ isn't just the first in time, but he's the first in type. Because now, God has done something in Jesus that connects us literally. It's no more, it's no more metaphor. It's no more, I mean, not that Adam and Eve weren't filled with God, but they were, he was showing us everything by them yeah. that was really about us and him. Mm-hmm. To be one with God. To be complete with God. To be to be back in authority, God's authority in human beings. So you can, you know, as a believer, you can be confident. Like Philippians 1.6 says, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, the perfect, the God-man. That's what he's doing. That's what he's trying to do by the word of God. Renew our mind. He's trying to perfect us so that we are not just in, in, uh, in God's knowledge, but in our own knowledge and in the knowledge. If we don't know it, Satan doesn't have to know it. He may have figured this out by now, but he doesn't have to respond to anything. He knew what Adam and Eve had. That's why he was jealous in the first place. But they didn't understand it the way they should have understood it. Or they wouldn't have thought God was withholding something from them. How could God withhold anything from them if he was one with them? That's why the scripture tells us that in him we are complete. He has given us all things in Jesus Christ. If he's given us himself, he says, then why would we think that he would not give us all things? What, What things are there outside of him? Praise God. So then, all, all of us, everybody that are, that are in Christ, and that's why I, I struggle with that, the believers. I understand why we say it, and I say it too, but I'm just saying, we're, we're so much more than believers. We are the reality. Of course you have to believe, but I'm saying, we have, we have dumbed it down to, well, you know, we're believers. This is a group of believers. No, this is, this is a, a group of Jesus or God in the flesh. Why do we have a problem saying that when that's everything that the Bible is trying to tell us? See, then all, all that are in Christ, God united. For everybody that's in Christ, God has united the fullness of our humanity to him or in him and vice versa. When Christ was crucified, you and I, this is why the scripture says it the way it says it. In our humanity, we're crucified with him. That's what Paul's talking about. I was crucified with Christ, yet I live. Yet it's not me that lives, but it's this God man now that lives. This Jesus guy. When Christ died for our sin, we died with him to sin. Sin has no more dominion over us. When Christ was resurrected, we were resurrected with him into life, into new life, into God life. Praise the Lord. When Christ was glorified, we were glorified. Because the scripture says, present tense, We are seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus.
So instead of being restored to the image of the first Adam, we are transformed into the image of the perfect image himself. Instead of being the, like the image of Adam, we are restored to the image that Adam was to be the image of. The perfect one. God. That, that's what he did. That's what he's done in Christ. We, we've dumbed it all down to a little religious ceremony and a few words and then off we go and praise the Lord, we're escaping hell. When God has invested and empowered us with all of the Godhead. Praise God. The firstborn of the new creation. Perfection. God life. So how, how does union with Christ affect our lives? Here and now. What real difference does it make? Well, it means that all things are possible yes. to those who are in Christ Jesus. Yes. Nothing shall be impossible to you. Thank you. That's our divine reality. Yes. As people that are made one with God, nothing shall be impossible. Was anything impossible for Jesus? Mm -hmm. No, we, we saw it. That's our divine reality. As those who have been made one with God. Satan's still trying to do what he's always done. He, he's trying to get us to buy his explanation of the world. Instead of understanding God's reality and God's truth of this world. And our position in it. And our authority over it. Last scripture, John 14, verses 10 through 12. That's why we ought to be bold. Yes. But it's also why we're not bold. Because we don't look at it this way. We look at it as something that God just comes along occasionally and empowers us to do something for a specific situation or a particular problem. We are the answer to every problem, just as Jesus was. Whatever the need is, that's what we're there for. Yeah. If healing's what's needed, yeah. we heal. You understand what I'm saying? God heals through us. Yeah. We are one with God. He can't, we can't be separated from him. Well, listen, if we don't get it now, you'll get it the moment you drop dead in the natural. You'll know it right away then. Yeah. Praise the Lord. You'll, you'll awaken to your true identity. You'll, you'll understand then. And if there's a tear in heaven, it'll be because we didn't get it sooner. Right. And what an impact, what a change we could have made. The same change Jesus made, we could have been making. Yes. And more. Believest thou not that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? This is Jesus, our older brother. Not a half-brother. Not a step-brother. Our older brother. Yes. Same genetics. Same father. Glory. Same life flowing through us. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he does the works. Yes. Believe me that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Yes. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Yes. Yes, Lord. Praise God. Uh, drop, drop down to verse 17. We'll read verses 17 through 20. Now look at, look at, this is following. This is right after what Jesus just said, right? And I said, I'm going to give you, because I'm going to the Father, because I'm going to give you something that's going to make you, I'm going to give you my Father's DNA. The same DNA I have, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you God life. Even the spirit of truth, the spirit of life. Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, whatever name you want to give it, whom the world cannot receive, 
because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you. Jesus, the Spirit was there with him. And you shall and he and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. God will come to you. This is God speaking through a human being. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm coming back. I'm going to the Father, but I'm coming back. God is coming back, and he's coming back to you. The Spirit in you. Ruach. God life. That's what he's talking about. Nothing shall be impossible again. This isn't about us being good, us being better. It's about us being children of God. It's about God's grace on top of grace that has empowered us to be one with God. Well, I mean, I just, just let this sink in this week. You're not some wishful thinking on God's part or on our part. We are a manifestation of God in the flesh. I know it, it, it goes against everything religion tells you. You know, humble yourself. And, you know, humbling yourself doesn't mean I'm nothing, I'm nobody, I'm a jerk. Humbling yourself just simply means to say the truth, walk in that truth without being overbearing, which is exactly what Jesus did. And they wanted, they wanted to kill him because he told him the truth. I am the son of God. You could say the same thing before Abraham was, I am. We had the right to say the very same thing. We were in Christ before the foundation of the world. We were in God before God spoke anything. He has reunited us, flesh and divinity. God Almighty and God's creation become one. Let, I mean, you've got to let your brain go. Because this is God thought. This is God plan. And, it, and the devil is determined, and, and he's depending on us using human thought yes. and human understanding and human wisdom because he can mess with all of that. Yes. He can make stuff look like it's real. He can make stuff sound like it ought to be true. And it's all a lie if it doesn't agree with him. Praise God. So, Sheila, you're absolutely right. What's in you saying, God, I just need to get out there and lay hands on somebody. It's not just a message. It's, it's that message resonating with the truth of God in whom you are. That's saying, that's my call, that's my purpose, that's, my, that's what I'm here for. If you can't believe me, then believe me for the very work's sake. Greater works than these will you do because I'm going and sending back God life so that you can be just like me in this earth. So that you can be my bride. Praise God. We are already betrothed and married to God. Yes. We're one with God. We're complete with God. Yes. We just haven't had the supper yet. Come on. We just haven't had the party yet because there's too much to be done right now. Yes. There'll be a party. There'll be a feast. Yes. And it'll be like one you never had before. Come on. And we'll all be wearing white. Pristine brides of Christ. Amen. He gave us a robe of righteousness, did he not? Hallelujah. We all know, we understand the white gown is white. It's to show that it's undefiled. The, the bride has waited for her husband. And God has made us undefiled and perfect in his sight so that we can wear that white robe to the wedding supper. And God sees us that way, perfect, his perfect bride who makes us complete makes us who we really are, who we were created to be. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Don't let the devil rob you of who you are in God. He has no power over you. He, he shakes in his boots at the very knowledge that we have when we exercise it. Resisting. And he'll flee like the rat that he is. Praise God. 
Amen. God bless all of you. Go in the power of his might. That's who you are in Jesus' name. God bless all of you. You're dismissed this morning in Jesus' name.